want to welcome those folks who will be watching this video. We're taping it on October the 13th, 2024. Here we are in beautiful Coombs, British Columbia on Vancouver Island. It's Thanksgiving Sunday, and I hope that you're experiencing many, many good blessings in your life, whether it's Thanksgiving Sunday where you're watching it now or maybe down the road. I'm uh, reading the scripture today a little differently than I normally do because I'm preaching from Romans chapter 9, which is a very, very complicated chapter of the Bible. But we're in this series going through the Paul's letter to the Romans, and here we are today at chapter 9. And so I've kind of got a couple of different readings that I'll be sharing, one at the start and then one a little later on. This is the first six verses in Romans chapter 9. O Israel, my people, Paul says, O my Jewish brothers and sisters, how I long for you to come to Christ. My heart is heavy within me, and I grieve bitterly day and night because of you. Christ knows, and the Holy Spirit knows, that it is no mere pretense when I say I would be willing to be forever damned if that would save you. God has given you so much, but still, you people of Israel, you don't listen to him. He took you as his own special chosen people. He led you along with a bright cloud of glory and told you how very much he wanted to bless you. God gave you his rules for daily life so you would know what God wanted you to do. God let you worship him and gave you mighty promises, great men and women of God were your fathers and mothers. And Christ himself is one of you, a Jew so far as his human nature is concerned. He who now rules over all things, praise God forever. That's how Paul starts the ninth chapter of his letter. As I said, I'm in this series and some of the passages of scripture in Romans are very, very tough slogging because Paul is going into deep theological discourse with people who he loves dearly, these small flocks of communities of faith in Rome, probably no more than two or 300 people at the most, a combination of Jews who came to believe in Jesus as well as Gentile converts who are now part of this, these small communities of faith. But the impetus for Paul's writing is that there were lots of divisions going on in the churches and he heard about it. And so he couldn't go there in person to be with the people and sort through the messes that were happening, but he could write. He's writing from Corinth. And so this letter to the Romans, which is the longest letter in the New Testament, is perhaps the most deeply theological, most important letter that Paul ever wrote which has impacted the Christian faith for ever since it was written. It's a profound letter, but it goes through some really deep stuff. Now, remember that the people who followed Jesus originally were all Jewish. And so when the apostles moved out of Jerusalem, they would always go to synagogues where the Jewish people were because the Jewish people knew the story of their culture, their faith, their history. And Jesus was a Jew. And of course, the early believers came to understand that Jesus was the Messiah, the Jewish Messiah, but not just for the Jews, but for all people. But in those early churches, it wasn't just Jewish people now who were coming to faith, but it was Gentile people. And when you have two cultures coming with very different worldviews and all sorts of different ideas about who God might be, there was these clashes of ideas and beliefs and cultural things that they had to kind of sort through. Now, you heard the anguish, I think, in Paul's you know, voice as you hear it behind this letter that he wrote. Oh, Israel, my people, oh, my Jewish brothers and sisters, how I long for you to come to Christ. I would rather be damned myself for all eternity if you would come and accept Jesus as Messiah. This is his heartfelt cry. And the issue that he's going to move through in chapter nine is that there was this concern that many of the Jewish people 
beyond the church were not coming to believe that Jesus was the Messiah. And that created a problem for not only the Jewish believers, but Paul himself, right? Why aren't more of my brothers and sisters who are Jewish, who know the story of being God's chosen people, who know the story of how the promised Messiah would come, why aren't they now coming and believing that Jesus is the Messiah? So many of the Jews of that day rejected Paul's claim and the apostles' claim that Jesus was the Messiah. It's like you're driving down a freeway, kind of in a convoy, and, and you come to a fork in the road, and, and you take this fork, and in the rearview mirror, you see all the other cars in the convoy, or a lot of them, take the other fork in the road, and you're wondering what's gone wrong. Many of Paul's friends, maybe even some of his family members, think that he is just plain wrong in believing that Jesus is a Jewish Messiah. And of course, this must have been the case for many of those early Jewish followers of Jesus, who as soon as they believed that Jesus was the Messiah, would have been cut off from their families. That's what would have happened most certainly in that day. Or the Gentile converts must have wondered why more Jewish people weren't buying into this whole thing about Jesus as Lord. So this is a real problem for the early church. They just couldn't understand it. And so you hear the anguish in Paul's voice in that first part of chapter nine. Now, the sad fact is this issue kept cropping up in Europe over the last 2,000 years. And it, the, the, the thought that the Jews had rejected Jesus became, was kind of weaponized and fomented the rise of anti-Semitism from pogroms in the Russian Empire in the late 1800s to the Holocaust in the Second World War, this, understand, this kind of view that the Jews rejected Jesus, therefore we need to reject them, created this, this whole epidemic of anti-Semitism, and we see it so evident even across our own nation. Yom Kippur was yesterday, I think, right? And the school, the Jewish school, girls' school, was, was shot at in Montreal. So you see that what Paul is talking about, even though it seems like it's a, a, an ancient problem, still rears its ugly head today. Now Paul isn't saying, and you'll, you'll hear me preach on this, that Jesus rejects the Jew or that he rejects the Jews. That's not what this is about. But people oftentimes have twisted the words of scripture to fit their own purposes, oftentimes to create this fear-based world that we live in, that there's them, and there's us, and we have to fight for what we believe. This is not the way of Jesus, but it happens so often. Now, if only those Christian communities from centuries back had really dug into these chapters, they would have seen that Paul isn't blaming the Jews for rejecting Jesus. He's not saying that the Jews killed Jesus, but in actual fact, he lays out two main points. First, <coughs> pardon me. This is an asthma cough. Water would be nice, thank you. Or if there's rum down there. <laughs> First, you heard it in those verses, he wants to affirm that God really did choose the Jewish people and God equipped them for everything that they needed, not only to follow God, but to love God, to worship God, and to be blessed by God. But his second point, that he explains is that Jesus is indeed the Messiah for everyone, despite the fact that many Jews have rejected him. Because Paul sees that there's a divine plan behind the scene that most people just don't see, but Paul understands it now very clearly. And he's gonna get into this in chapter nine. Now Paul understands that God wasn't surprised or sidetracked by this the fact that the many Jewish people did not believe that Jesus was the Messiah. And on the, uh, and on the surface, um, it seems harsh that you know, the, the Jews rejected Jesus. But Paul says that in actual fact, God is going to use this for something good. Remember the famous verse in Romans 8.28 that I preached on last week? Thanks, honey. 
one of my favorite passages of scripture. And we know that in all things, God works together for the good of those who love him, who've been called according to God's purposes that we might be conformed into the image of Jesus Christ and become sons and daughters of the most high God. This is Paul's foreshadowing of how God took the rejection of Jesus by his own people and brought something amazing and good out of it. Just um, as a bit of a refresher, remember Paul was this orthodox Jewish Pharisee. He was a real law keeper who when he had this personal encounter with the risen Jesus became this fanatic follower of Jesus. And then as an apostle, he spent most of the next 20 years of his life going from small town to big cities in all of Asia Minor, spreading the gospel message. And every place that he went to, the very first places he would go to would be to the synagogues. Because again, he's Jewish. He knows he will be accepted there. He knows their story. He lived their story. So he understands that if God has come through the Jewish people and Jesus is a Jewish Messiah, then surely there would be this receptive audience in those synagogues wherever they were in the Asia Minor world. But frequently, Paul was rejected. He was tossed out. Sometimes he was beaten up and then tossed out. That's when Paul decided that perhaps it might be safer and smarter to start talking to non-Jews. And that's what he did. And so in community spaces, libraries, in the town circles, Paul would oftentimes now engage in his conversation with non-Jewish people, with Gentile people. And so they were more receptive, Paul found, to the good news of the gospel. And it's this very situation has led to the expansion of the gospel well beyond the Jewish culture and religion. So Paul says, it isn't a failure in God's plan just because Jewish people rejected Jesus, but rather it's led to something good, to a breakthrough for God's larger work to bring grace, hope, and salvation to people beyond the Jewish faith. See, Paul starts to understand that even though the Jewish people may have rejected the idea that Jesus was the Messiah, that doesn't mean that God's plan to bless all the world was a failure. When we were in Newfoundland just this past June, Connie and I spent some time in St. John's. And if you've been there, you probably went to Signal Hill, uh, which is just outside of St. John's. And this is where there's a museum, the Marconi Museum. Remember the Marconi? It's a, you know, a famous brand. But Marconi uh, was the one who first tested telephone using radio beams. Now, he, like many other inventors, had multiple failures in his equipment prior to that breakthrough. He began his experiments when he was only 20 years old in about 1894 uh, because he believed that you should be able to transmit you know, signals or communicate you know, long distances through transmission beams. But he had failure after failure after failure. But Seven years later, in 1901, December the 12th, Marconi raised a 150 meter long antenna which was attached to a kite, and that was over Signal Hill, and he received the first transatlantic signal ever sent on radio waves. The signals for the letter S in Morse code came from Marconi's high-powered wireless transmitting station in Cornwall in the United Kingdom, 3,500 kilometers away. 1901, after many failures, that's the first time we had telephone kind of reception. So you might ask, were all of Marconi's earlier tests a failure? Or were there successes that in actual fact led to that breakthrough? And of course we'd say, well, they weren't failures because it moved them forward into finding the beam that actually did work. Now, in a similar way, that's what Paul is arguing. By the Jewish people rejecting Jesus as the Messiah, it pushed Paul and other apostles to move beyond into the Gentile world with this same message, that God has used the Jewish people and has blessed them and has chosen them. And in the course of time, Jesus was sent as the Messiah. But it wasn't only for the Jewish people, it was for all people. 
But it took Paul a little while to get to that understanding. If Paul had simply stayed in the synagogue, he would have only reached a small group of people. But because his message was often rejected by the Jewish folks that he encountered, he was forced to go into the marketplaces, as I've said. And that changed the gospel reception because now Gentile people heard the message and were saved and the churches started to grow. And we know the trajectory of that today. There are about 16 million Jewish people in the world, but there are over 2 billion Christian people in the world. God was at work even in the midst of what seemed like the Jewish people rejecting Jesus, Paul sees, no, God was able to use something that looked bad on the outside for something good. So as we continue in Romans 9, this leads to Paul's thought on divine election. The idea that God chooses certain people or groups for God's purposes in order to accomplish certain things in the world. So let me get this passage out. I can find it. And I'm using the Living Bible Translation. So here we are. We're a little ways in at uh, verse 10. He's going into the Jewish history. And he says, Isaac was grown up and married, and Rebekah, his wife, was about to bear him twin children. God told her that Esau, the child born first, remember the oldest brother? That in actual fact, he would be a servant to his younger brother, Jacob, remember Jacob would be, have his name changed to Israel, right? So already you see that God is starting to sprinkle in the scriptures that there are certain people who are chosen. And God said, I chose to bless Jacob, but not Esau. And God said this before the children were even born, before they had done anything either good or bad. This proves that God was doing what he had decided from the beginning. It wasn't because of what the children did, but because of what God wanted and chose. Was God being unfair? Of course not. For God said to Moses, if I want to be kind to someone, I will. If I want to show mercy on someone, I will. And so God blesses those, and they are given to God because he has mercy on them. And he has the right, God has the right to take others such as ourselves, who have been made for pouring the riches of God's glory into whether we are Jew or Gentile and to be kind to us so that everyone can see how very great God's glory is. Now, <coughs> here we see this strange notion of divine election, that God chooses a certain person or a certain group of people, and it seems very exclusive, but I'll get to this in a few minutes. Paul refers to the book of Genesis, where God chooses this older couple, Sarah and Abraham, not because they're, they, you know, they're perfect people, but God chooses them even in their old age and promises that, that from them will become the nation of Israel. And then Paul goes on to show how God chooses Isaac over Ishmael, Jacob over Esau, in order to move this project of blessing all nations forward. And uh, I think part of it is that God isn't just looking on the outside, but God is looking at the hearts of people who seem to be more receptive to God's presence or spirit, people who are more willing to take risks for God. And Paul says that God hasn't rejected the Jewish people. No, they're the chosen people because it was through them that the law was given and that Christ came to open wide God's grace to all people. This is divine election. That's what Paul says. God choosing specific people or groups to receive blessings and purpose, but not simply for the sake of the individual or the group, but in order to be a blessing to all the people around them and the nations included that. Now, folks, I know a little bit about divine election. Now, you probably already assume that, correct? Because I'm a pastor. I'm fairly gifted. Well, let me tell you my experience with divine election. It happened, in actual fact, on the playground, the football field, uh, Kensington Junior High School in Burnaby, North Burnaby, and I was in grade nine. Now, I was a little scrawny teenager. You could probably imagine that. During the recess or lunch times, the boys would often go onto the field 
and they'd start pick up games, pick up football games. And I'd always be hanging around the edges, hanging around the edges. That's what I would do. No one ever chose me. I never got picked because it was obvious that I was not an athlete. I'm still not an athlete. But one day it happened. I was picked to play. That's divine election. And better than that, the quarterback, once I was on the team, like you know how this works. It's usually the bigger guys, the more athletic guys, the guys who are the captains of the team. They choose the team, and, and I was never chosen. But that day, the quarterback chose me. And lo and behold, he threw the ball to me. Never happened before in my life. I caught it and run for, ran for a touchdown. I was the hero. I was the divine chosen one. Now that lasted about five minutes. Because the next time, of course, the quarterback's thinking, I've got, a, I've got a winner right here. I've got a real winner. So he throws the ball to me, and what do you think I did? Fumbled it. Exactly. My football career was ended. Now, divine election is about how God chooses people who don't always look like the best and the brightest. God often looks for those who feel they don't have much to offer God. Maybe that's how you felt or still feel, that you don't have much to offer God. But in actual fact, that's exactly who God is looking for. Now, just think of this. Abraham and Sarah couldn't have children, but God chooses them. Moses was a Jew raised in the Egyptian pharaoh's courts, and after he murdered an Egyptian slave taskmaster, fled into the wilderness for 40 years. But God found Moses when he was at his lowest point, and God said, Moses, I've got a task for you. You're going back to Egypt, and you're going to be the one for whom will speak up for me. I'm choosing you. And we know the story. Moses led the enslaved people, the enslaved people, people who had no power, the most powerless people in the world. God says, no, I've still got a purpose for you. Moses, you go back and get those people because they're my people. And that's exactly what happened. God leads them through the Exodus into the promised land. God chooses Mary, an unknown teenage girl, to become the mother of Jesus the Messiah. Jesus chooses carpenters and fishermen and tax collectors, some women of questionable, uh, you know, kind of backgrounds, become followers of Jesus. God looks at those who don't feel loved, and God loves them and chooses them for divine work, to spread God's love and compassion liberally. And it's through the Jewish story in the person of Jesus that Paul says God now brings grace and salvation to the wider Gentile world. Jesus didn't look like much on the cross, I guarantee you. But this is how God chose for all the world to be saved. Not just the Jewish Messiah, but the Messiah for all people. Now, I know divine election sounds a bit exclusive, but in reality, being chosen is the biblical sense, in the biblical sense of the word, is this counterweight to the main thrust of history, which focuses on those who are born into wealth or power or some divine ruling class. And this is anything but that. God rarely chooses people who are already at the pinnacle of power. God chooses people who are at the bottom of the ranks. Because God understands that when God chooses someone at the bottom, they can have a transformation in their life. And they can become the vehicles through which God's presence and blessings not just are contained for themselves, but now can be spread liberally to the people around them. You see, it's not about being chosen for your own family or tribe's well-being, but for the well-being of other tribes. This is what happened first of all with the Jewish people. It's about mission, purpose, calling, acting for the well-being of those beyond their own group. This is a totally new idea in the ancient world. You always fought for your own tribe, your own people, but God says, no, the blessings that I pour into your life as a chosen person are not for you alone. They are for the world around so that others will see my glory in you. A person who would have been forgotten, who would have been not chosen to be on the football team, but God's gonna choose you, Ed, and I've got some good things in store for you. I could have gone on to a great NFL career, I'm sure, 
but God had other plans. And I'm grateful for that. In chapter 9, Paul talks about this very thing, that God is now choosing Gentile people to be part of God's kingdom, moving it forward. And and many of the Jewish people, of course, had a hard time believing that God would use non-Jewish people to move forward this blessing and the the news of the kingdom of God. But this is exactly what God does. God saw beyond to the masses of people who are not in the initial covenant, and he wanted to bring them into the family in this very unique way through Christ. The original Jewish covenant between God and Israel was that the Jewish people were chosen by God to be a blessing to all nations. But even though the vision got distorted along the way because the people missed the point and felt like those blessings were kept for themselves because they're the chosen people. No, Paul says even though it looks like Jewish people were rejecting Jesus as the Messiah, God's rescue mission wasn't a failure. No, like Marconi, it actually led to something incredible because now we see that God has been working all through the Jewish people at first then through Jesus the Messiah, born in the lineage of the Jewish patriarchs, and he goes to the cross to extend God's purposes and God's kingdom so that everyone now can be a chosen son or daughter of the Most High God. And today, we are chosen. I hope you feel that you're chosen. You may not feel all that special. It's okay, it's okay. But the reality is God has called each of us God has blessed each of us in so many ways. And God says, don't keep those blessings to yourself. Even if you're chosen, if you know divine election, it's not just about you. It is about what I am doing in the world. And God can use us for great purposes when we are willing to be open to the Spirit's moving and power. Today on Thanksgiving Sunday, I hope you feel those blessings of God in a fresh new way. I'm not just saying everything in your life is rosy. I know it's not. I'm sure it's not. But let's remember how much we do have. Let's be thankful that God loves us, that God will never leave us or abandon us, that God's blessings continue to reach us every day we live. They come through family and friends. They come through work and rest. They come through sacrifice and service. They come through nature and the divine hand of God resting upon us. Friends, we have Jesus, the greatest gift of all. And we will celebrate that gift and the sacrifice that enables us to be the chosen ones. The chosen ones. Because of what Jesus did to move the gospel from the Jewish people to the wider world. So that all of us, all people, could understand that they truly are daughters and sons of the Most High God. And that's something to be thankful for. Amen. Funny.